Welcome to our first new releases tasting. Um, I can't believe we've done, I think, five official virtual tastings since we closed in March um, and some other informal things. It's a strange new world, but it is really good to see all the familiar faces on here. Um, I think we basically know everybody, but Christy and Joe from Foresight. Um, Joe's our winemaker. I kind of do everything else, yes. not everything. <laughs> Including convincing me to make two new wines in 2019. <laughs> yes, <laughs> two new wines. I know, we're, we're uh, very excited. So um, a few housekeeping items while we kind of wait for everybody to log on and join us. Um, you are automatically muted um, as you join. Uh, we learned a few tips from our son's kindergarten distance learning classes. <laughs> so if you want to uh, speak, unmute yourself or use the chat button. Um, I'll be monitoring the, the FSW, the Foresight Wines chat while we're online today. Um, so you can also put anything you want to ask there. And don't be shy. I mean, you know, we all kind of know each other. So just ask questions as we go along. We're going to taste. We're going to show you a few slides. We're going to taste some more, a few more slides. And, you know, if you have any other questions not related to the new releases, like I know everybody wants to know about vintage 2020 and fires and all of that, um, we can have a little bit of a chat at the end if you would like um, and talk about whatever else. Um, we're here. We have about an hour scheduled, but we, we can spend a little bit more time with you guys if you want to be online with us. So that's the lay of the land for today. Um, who's drinking some Van Gris? Or Van Gris, it says on the label, but Van Gris. Not yet. Quite a few. All right. Who's drinking orange wine right now? <clears throat> so we've got a little bit of both. Cool. Anybody drinking both? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> a few? I cannot see. Like us? <laughs> okay. That's what I pointed. That says mute, that little okay. red thing. So we're going to start with the Van Gris, the 2019 um, first. So um, if you've got a pour <laughs> of that, <clears throat> raise it up um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the wine and kind of the history of the wine. So I'm gonna have Joe share our screen here. Um, we're gonna show you guys just a couple little slides and then we'll be back to drink it with you after. Your glass, my dear. <laughs> the bar, get out of my way. Bear with us. There's always a technical difficulty on these. <laughs> That's good. Yum. Okay. Everybody can see our slides, right? So I'm going to let Joe talk a little bit about the, the Van Gris um, and this current release, why we made it, how it's made, all of that good stuff. So here we are with the 2019 Van Gris of Pinot Noir. The reason that uh, we chose this name for the 2019 and the 2011 wine is that it literally translates, you know, gray wine of Pinot Black. And so it's meant to be a hyper traditional uh, rosé style of winemaking where there's very little color and what color comes through in Pinot is more of a pale pink or salmon color. Pinot only has three pigments in its skins, and so rosés from Pinot don't tend to be very dark anyways. This particular style in Burgundy is especially denoted by whole cluster grapes or use of whole cluster pressed grapes, meaning that they're not making pink wines um, by other methods that are sort of byproducts of other types of red wine fermentations. These grapes were all harvested on the estate like four to five days earlier. Um, it's in a block that we wouldn't use for the other Pinots. This is a new block that we butted over from Sauvignon Blanc, I think in 2016, I believe, uh, is when it was butted over. So we were also able to make one of these in 2020, where we did uh, identical style and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we put this in the wooden slatted basket press. That's the picture that you see here. This is part of the basket press, but the whole cluster is directly in and squeeze the juice off. This is essentially a champagne or a sparkling wine style um, and would be the same way that we would make a, a base cuvee if, 
if and when we finally get around to making sparkling wine, we would do this Soon exact this exact same style. It would be a Blanc de Noir rosé from natural skin pigmentations, where we would put the whole cluster of grapes in. The only difference would be that we would pick the grapes, say, another five or maybe seven days even earlier for more acidity um, and less sugar. So. The flavors that we get out of this um, are a little bit different than some rosés. You know, malolactic fermentation has got a little bit of a bad name in white wine making, but historically, you know, all wines went through mallow. Otherwise, you had to do chemical additions or sterile filtrations, pasteurization to make and sure. So for those who are not as geeky as you, what is malolactic fermentation? Malolactic is that uh, secondary bacterial fermentation that typically takes place after the alcoholic fermentation in the cellar. So. Um, many white wines do not undergo this process to retain the malic acid, which is like that Granny Smith apple acid. Um, many white wines that are grown in climates that are too warm for the varietal, they stop malic fermentation to retain that acidity, to, to retain a, a freshness to the wine. In our case in Anderson Valley, it's almost the exact opposite, or it is uh, basically the way we interpret it. Our acidities are so high that if we don't go through malolactic, the wines are overly acidic. The other benefit there is that this is a completely unfiltered wine um, because they're, the alcohol all fermented out, it's bone dry, there's no residual sugar here. And also because the bacteria went through its full process, we don't need to, to filter this wine to stabilize it. We also did this in all um, older French oak barrels and that also adds to the mouthfeel and richness to the body because unlike a stainless tank being similar to a screw cap, those wine that, you know, that container is not going to breathe. When wine is in a barrel or placed under cork, that aging process and oxygen getting into the wine is uh, changing and making the wine more rich and, and changing the flavor profiles. Um, we did all native yeast and native malactic like we do on all of our wines. Um, it was probably only on the skins for about two hours, give or take. That's just the logistical amount of time that basically takes to load the press and get through a press cycle to pull out the juice. Um, that we're looking to, to ferment later down the road. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Oh, hello. And we can talk to you guys face to face. Um, so I'm gonna go into a little bit about the flavors. So I get, and we're all so personal, a lot of like strawberry and peach, some, you know, stone fruit. Um, maybe a little bit of floral in the nose and you get like a, um, I get almost like a flinty, some minerality in the finish to this wine. So um, does anybody have anything they want to contribute about? I mean, how does it taste? It's the first time we've produced one of these since 2011. Do you have any, uh, any feedback, any flavors, any food pairings you're coming, you know, come to mind? <laughs> this is like calling on people in class, huh? <laughs> I got a bunch of food pairings. <laughs> I think it's very crisp. Um, so until someone wants to jump in, um, what we would pair this with. I'll jump. Um, Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> salmon salad. That was one we had it with the other night because Lemons had some salmon. So we did that on the uh, pellet grill and had it with that. It was phenomenal. Watermelon gazpacho. We tried it with that. That was uh, phenomenal. Um, not too spicy. Um, the other one we have here is yours. Oh, yeah. I sent you guys an email, a little reminder email earlier, um, and it had a recipe for um, pine nut olive oil cookies with, um, you do like a barely sweetened or maybe not sweetened at all, um, whipped cream on top and you do, oh look, Paula's got it. <laughs> um, you do uh, strawberry slices and it's really good. I mean, it's more of a bite, you know, it's not a meal, but, um, the Dory Kwan, a chef on the Mendocino Coast, created that uh, recipe for us in 2011 when we did our last Van Gris. Um, so it's really delicious with the Van Gris. Um, it's really fun, you know, who makes a cookie with thyme? It's savory, it's weird, it's good. Um, so that's one of my favorites. But, you know, honestly, brunch. Brunch has been my favorite pairing for this wine. And the reason why is we are in the hospitality business. So we work weekends and we work holidays. So it's like the unicorn for people um, who work in the hospitality business is brunch because you don't ever get to go out in a rural area like ours and have brunch on a Tuesday. <laughs> so um, we, that's one of our COVID silver linings has been um, brunch. 
So we had this with crepes. We did a rhubarb like compote. And then we did a savory crepe where we did um, like cherry tomatoes and goat cheese and corn. Um, it was really good. So, you know, that was our 10.30 a.m. We had a bunch of rosé and some crepes. <laughs> Great with BLTs. She can put this just like we, uh, in the beginning of COVID, we did a sparkling white wine um, recipe through with the soda stream, basically. You could do the same thing with the pink wine, yeah. um, which we've done a little bit. Makes phenomenal sangria if you really want to step your sangria game up to, you know, level 100 plus plus. <laughs> Just start with a couple bottles of this stuff um, as, as, your, as your baseline. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments? Um, I see a thumbs up. Yeah? Thumbs up. That's okay. yes. I'd say scallops. Can we? Oh, that sounds good. Okay. I'm not sure we can hear you. Can you be a little louder? Oh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I, I would say scallops. scallops. The other night with brown butter poached scallops, and it was phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Scallops. Well, I mean, scallops with any white or pink. Um, we just had the wine song weekend, which was supposed to be wine song, right? Which is a big uh, fundraiser on the Mendocino coast. And our tradition is to grill scallops. And I do like a Meyer lemon um salsa that goes over the top and usually that's like my little treat some of you heard me say this i think last week at the wine song virtual fundraiser we did um but my like my birthday is always on this weekend um which is uh wine song and so i usually get to go hide out back with um i will admit like a beer <laughs> and grill scallops and it's you know it's fun it's a fun thing to do but scallops are one of our favorites with any any of the whites um, or the Van Gris, I think it'll be great. You have to push the chat button to talk. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, Kevin, Laura, Eric, Susan, hi. Um, yeah. Do you press first and then ferment? Correct, yeah. This is uh, taking red grapes and making white wine. So yeah, we're just relieving the, the grapes of the juice and then the skins which get shipped off to our friends with the cattle. That it's a very French thing. We're relieving the grapes of their juice. <laughs> a small portion of their juice. Not, we don't press that hard. But um, the last time we made one of these was back in 2011. I don't know how many of you had a chance to try that. The motivation for that vintage was a little different. At that time, that was a very cool vintage. That was very late. And uh, basically, we made the determination that half of our grapes were not going to get ripe enough to make red wine that vintage. Mm -hmm. So we made pink wine that year. Half of our production was pink wine, the Vin Gris. Yay! <laughs> and what little red wine we made was also uh, did very well within the press and, and whatnot because it all came in before the winter rains. So now we have a block that's basically dedicated to making this wine. So we intend to keep it in the future 2020s in the back fermenting right now. And uh, we plan to make one in 2021 as well, weather permitting, of course. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> um, so I'm actually, there's a, there's a um, question about the difference between Van Gris and Rosé. I'm gonna put that on pause for one sec, um, share our screen here. We have a little bit more we wanna show you about um, just Van Gris, what is it, um, kind of the history of this wine. Um, voila. So, the literal translation of Van Gris is gray wine, which is not a terribly sexy way to put it, but it's somewhere in between, uh, you know, noir, which is black, and blanc, which is white. So it's gray. Um, and so it is actually made all over the world. Um, you see the cool camel photo there? I thought that was really fun. Um, it is uh, in Morocco. Morocco, they make gray wine. They make a lot of gray wine, actually. It's non-varietal. Um, they have a lot of Syrah, Grenache, and Carignan. Of course, you know, the French were there, so a lot of influence from that. Um, in Greece, they make a, uh, a Van Gris out of Moshko Filero, which I'm probably butchering that. I'm sorry, I don't speak Greek. I'm hoping none of you do either. <laughs> Um, and in Lorraine, um, they do a Van Gris from Gamay. So it's actually, they do it all over the world, but of course, you know, the inspiration here for us is typically Burgundy, given what we can grow in Anderson Valley. 
So, and then there's this little bullet point up that says Sanye or whole cluster pressed. So I'm gonna turn that over to Joe um, to answer the question about the difference between a Van Gris and a regular rosé and the different the types of rosés you can make because there's actually several. So there's, there's many different ways to uh, essentially create a wine that is some shade of pink um, thereafter. The style that we're making is whole cluster pressed grapes. Typically those are lighter color. Um, that's, this is the requirement for um, rosés from the Rhone Valley, um, also for Vingri in Burgundy. Um, but the most popular method is Sangye, and that is basically a, a, a byproduct <clears throat> type production of wine where you will harvest red grapes at red grape sugar levels and metrics. Then the next day you will come back and take anywhere from 10 to 30% of the juice out of that given tank. Then you will add water and acid to make the chemistry like you harvested that juice for white grapes. And so um, this is also how in really, really intensely colored Pinot Noir specifically, I'll stay on that varietal. <clears throat> if there's Pinot that you can't see through, it's been mucked with. And this is one of the number one ways for people to concentrate color and tannin on Pinot Noir is to drain some of the juice off because you have the same amount of skins in the tank but you have a lot less juice. And so the skin to juice ratio is, is automatically changed. For us in our still Pinot production, we don't manipulate it that way. In Burgundy, it's, it's legal to do Sangye, but you have to put it in the drain or just keep it as home wine. It's not able to be sold as a, another wine byproduct or product. Um, so for us, we're not wanting to get the, the ripeness that you would want for red grapes. And um, also the other way is to actually just add red wine into white wine. And this is something most notably that would be done in sparkling wine. It's one of the methods that is allowed, though very few producers practice it. In a rosé, right? That's how... Yeah, they make a rose. very light-bodied uh, red wine that then they add at, you know, one to three percent or, or what have you to a white wine to, to get to pink it up, as they call it, to pink it up that way. Um, there's also uh, food coloring concentrates that are used where... Um, you know, you can put a little bit of uh, basically grape skin concentrate into uh, white wine or into pink wine. A lot of pink wines have this additive to make them like electrified pink or um, what I call LED pink. Sometimes there are pink wines that sit on the shelf in the grocery store or the wine shop and you see them. They look like they have a little LED light underneath them. They just seem to be glowing off the shelf. That's because that color is not natural. It's been added and enhanced. And um, uh, this, this style here that we have, this pale pink salmon color, is not something that many people are used to. And when we made our first one in 2011, there was uh, a lot of producers here who didn't believe that you could sell a wine this pale. Um, I, I just said we could sell anything that's made traditionally, and that's, that's what we generally try and stick to. So, um, Well, put it in the glass, right? I mean, we used to be able to put this in the glass in person for you, um, and we will again soon, but now we get to do it virtually. Oh. One other thing I want to touch on, we're going to jump over to the other wine real quick, is this, uh, the corks that we're using um, in now in this particular vintage. These are what's called micro agglomerated corks. The number one pain in the bum kiss that you guys will have is that uh, they don't like to shove back into the bottle very well. But this is a, it's a technical cork where they take all these teeny little pieces and they sterilize them in CO2 and then they reassemble the cork. We actually trialed this cork on the 10 and the 11 whites and then went away for it for a little while and now we're back on it. Um, and uh, it's a very reliable product that we're, we're happy to use. And um, awesome. yeah, you don't have to worry about uh, essentially the cork taint or TCA or bottle variability nearly as much as you do with natural cork. As with all things, you know, prices keep going up and up and up and up and up. And, um, this is an awesome alternative that uh, that we decided to go with on the whites for for this vintage. So I have a few questions. Um, well, a comment mostly. Christina says we're getting lots of citrus notes. Perfect for brunch. Quiche frittata. Yes, quiche frittata. All of those. Um, also, when is the new when the new block is matured to prime Pinot Noir production age? Will you start using the fruit to make red wine, or continue with the green? Uh, it will not go into our red wine production. It's on a different trellising. Um, so basically, the we have a white wine kind of half of the vineyard, and then we have a red wine half of the vineyard. The red wine half is all on the vertical shoot positioning that looks like the regular rows we're all used to seeing. The white grapes and the pink wine are on a trellising that's shaped like a football goal. 
and there's actually four cordones per vine, quadrilateral cordon. So we had a little bit of Pinot planted this way in the very beginning, um, specifically was being sold for sparkling wine. And so it would always, uh, for me, go into something like the unoaked Pinot, which um, I'm sure many of you remember. So th that could potentially be another thing for that block. But um, it's always going to be bubbles, pink. Um, it, it, won't, it won't end up in the premium Pinot ever. That's, it's, just, it's just the wrong type of trellising for those kind of goals, in my opinion. Sorry, I know a lot of people here make a lot of Pinot off quadrilateral cordon single clone, but I don't have any interest in doing that. <laughs> He's such a Pinot geek, right? <laughs> quadrilateral cordon. Who understood that? <laughs> probably, actually, probably some of you did. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah there's some hands raised. <laughs> um, I probably can bring up a photo of the vineyard if you want, or if you want to just move ahead. Everybody has pretty much seen it. Grab a little sheet, but yeah, I, most of you guys have seen the overhead, so I yeah. think we're good there. So the trellis this is on is shaped like that. I can't tell if the angle of my hands are properly aligned oh, for you. There we go. Um, versus the rest of the Pinot is shaped like that. So um, it <laughs> tends to be, you know, different, a little more productive than the other blocks that are like this. Um, so anyway, it's going to be our new rosé block, we hope. Sparkling, maybe someday. Ooh, sparkling. Yeah, we, yeah. we have had a lot better luck with the vineyard in taking out half of the Sauvignon Blanc and turning it into Pinot. So there's a whole nother acre that's coming online there as well. We have just eliminated many of the clients. I'm making a lot more Sauvignon Blanc. We're dealing with less people. The two large wineries that were getting some of that fruit are no longer. So um, we've decided to push it into Pinot and it's way easier to sell and way easier to farm. And I have more options I, I will do with it. So what is the aging potential on the, the Vangri? I know there's multiple people on the screen that I've shared that 2011 in the last year or two with me. There's still bottles squirreled away. So um, because this is, you know, not, it, this is not bottled. It's, this is not fast white, as I would say. This is not wine that was harvested in September, bottled in January to be released April 1st. Um, up to 10 years, you know, depending on your palate, if you have good storage, et cetera. Definitely, you know, three to five without even blinking. Um, there's, there's, not, there's no reason to not. Um, it's still single vineyard designated, you know, same all the winemaking things as we do with the rest of the wines. So does the different trellising affect the ripening or some other aspect is the question. Yeah, there's twice as much cordon per vine. So it, it sets a larger crop, um, which can slow down the ripening. Um, again, just kind of depending on the vintage. It can also um, not set as much of a crop. If we have a wetter year, we have to go drop more fruit because it doesn't have the same airflow. So it's a little bit of a, um, it's a, it's a riskier trellising, but there are rewards. It, mainly, it, it was there for the Sauvignon Blanc, but it's very easily adaptable to Pinot Noir. Almost all the Pinot that is going to the sparkling producers here is produced on that type of trellising to just try and eke out another ton or maybe up to two tons per acre because you don't need the same quantity of sugar for those type of wines. They're typically being harvested earlier. So there's one notable Pinot Noir producer in Russian River that uses only cordon, I mean, sorry, only um, open liar trellising, right? That's correct. Daylinger winery. Daylinger. Um, yeah. Slowly uh, replanted, but replanting in that same with the, with the color coding and stuff. Um, it's not as popular right now because, you know, a lot of new vineyards are trying to think about mechanical harvesting, you know, what that's going to look like in the next 20 or 30 years. And it's not a trellising technique that would allow for that in any way, shape or form. All right. Um, any other questions about the Van Gris? Is it good? <laughs> yes. Thumbs up. That's the important part, right? Um, you know, we, we all love rosé, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, I just heard this week uh, a country music artist, a young female, sing an entire song about rosé. You can look it up. Um, I was pretty surprised. <laughs> so Not as surprised um, <laughs> as I was when it came on the speaker on the crush pad, though. <laughs> uh, she actually says rosé all day. Um, so, you know, it's, it's making its way into um, even country music now, Rosé, which, you know, 
I mean, 10 years ago, it was just wine geeks that really drank, you know, these pale Van Greens and Rosés. So, um, all right. Well, we are going to move in to the um, Evans Orange Wine so. now. And um, we, really, we really considered bringing Evan on. I yeah. think maybe, Kevin, you had a question about bringing Evan on today. But um, I'll be honest, he, he's five and a half, and he's just as likely to talk about his boogers as he is uh, actually stay on topic with wine. <laughs> we, we tried to videotape a few answers to like why he loves to help with orange wine and all this stuff. And yeah, I mean, it was just, we couldn't even get a sentence or three that was worth um, putting he is, forth. So. He's unpredictable, but you know, if, if we have a future tasting, maybe for the, you know, the little more free flow uh, wine club party we're doing on October 17th, um, where we're just chatting, maybe we'll bring Evan in for a few minutes and he can just chat with you. But you know, it's hard to keep him on topic right now. It's all, it's all over. So um, yeah, you know, and, and those of you know him, he loves, he's like kind of a screen hog. Him off of here would actually be a problem. So, all right, we're gonna refresh our glasses with some orange wine. Don't let that go to waste. Okay, you're ready to try some orange? All right. So 2019 Evans Orange Wine. So you notice both of these are actually pretty low octane. Um, the uh, the Van Gris is 13.1. This one's 12.9. So you know we we love that in our white wines. Um, I can't say we we actually did make one vintage of white wine that was about 14 um, percent. It's risky drinking that wine. <laughs> One glass. Woo. Um, so it's nice to have something a little lower octane you can have a little bit more of and you know enjoy. So um, I am going to share our screen and we'll talk a little bit about the orange wine. I'll let Joe talk about this and then we'll get to questions and comments and all of that stuff. There we go. Evans Orange Wine. So um, this is actually the fourth vintage that we've produced of this, but only the first one that's ever been re released commercially. Um, it's a style of wine that I've been familiar with for a long time. It began to start being imported into the States around 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago. There was a festival in New York called the Orange Wine Festival hosted by Levy Dalton. Um, who has a phenomenal wine podcast, although exceptionally geeky. It's called I'll Drink to That by Levy Dalton. He's a psalm or was a psalm in New York and wanted to start getting this style of wine more known in the United States. At that time, most of it was coming from the northern part of Italy, where, where the majority of orange wine currently is still produced in regards to something you might actually be able to go into a wine shop and purchase. Um, there are at least a couple dozen producers in California that produce orange wine, but like us, it's typically in absolutely minuscule quantities. One of the main reasons that I have not produced an orange wine to date is because a commercial version is that, um, you know, making wine is the easy part, selling is the hard part. And um, I know there's multiple people on this Zoom that have tasted versions of our home orange wine that we've talked about here in the tasting room. And uh, the food pairing aspect was one of the hardest things for us to kind of wrap our head around. And just the idea of explaining um, orange wine, I get, I get a bit tripped up. Christy's got some better acronyms. Um, but basically uh, the most animated any conversation gets with friends of ours in the wine business at, at our dinner table or at a restaurant is around orange wine. And so when Evan was asked what kind of wine he wanted to make when he was three years old, he decided that he, I, I was, I said, Evan, what kind of wine do you want to make? And I assumed, you know, that that was the lead in question to it's red or white. That's what he was really into at that point and identifying the different um, shapes of the bottles with the red wine versus the white wine bottles. Um, but then he said orange wine. And so um, uh, we, we know that that's because he loves to talk and he's a very high energy guy. Hold on. We do have a little Evan here. Oh yeah, that's right. There it is. So. <laughs> This is Evan um, punching down his orange wine. The one that he made was made out of Semillon grapes. Um, I've made one out of Sauvignon Blanc, one out of Semillon commercial or for home use. 
when I say home use, we're talking about five to six gallons of wine, you know, which equates to about two cases of wine. So um, the orange wine was also the first wine that I did uh, a no sulfur trial on. So one of the years that I made orange wine from Semion, I bottled half of it with sulfur and half of it with no sulfur added at bottling at all whatsoever. And we still have a few bottles of that uh, right now. So basically you're taking white grapes and making and using red wine making techniques um, to, uh, to produce it. So we're doing hand punch downs. We're doing, you know, all the same techniques, partial whole cluster. This particular law was 25% whole clusters in the bottom. The rest of the grapes went through the destemmer. We use the same open top, uh, no temperature control um, fermenter that we use for the Pinot Noir. It was all hand punched down. This was one stainless drum we made and a, a couple stainless carboys. I think it was 25 cases or so production, 55, 60 gallons, somewhere in there. It was on the skins for 21 days. And then we put it through that wooden slatted basket press, same way as we, you know, the same device that we use to press the reds and then to also make the uh, thing three that we just tried. Um, so what happens, the reason it's called orange wine is because some of those pigments that are in the skin oxidize off and turn orange. I don't know how much experience anybody here has with older white wine or especially older sweet wine or ice wine or something like that. But when those wines, Riesling, Gewurz, ice wine are 20 years old, they become very, very dark golden brown. And orange is basically somewhere in the middle of white and brown. And so the pigments are oxidized off. Now from a food pairing standpoint, you're gonna get some tannin here, um, not from new oak. This was done in a stainless drum. Typically, when we're talking about tannin in white wine, you're talking about new oak aged uh, Chardonnay. Um, but this is a white wine that actually has some tannin. And so the, the food pairing options open up um, kind, of, uh, kind of dramatically. Um, being that it was actually supposed to be fair weekend in our local Lauren's restaurant the, last night and tonight is doing fair food as their, all their uh, family to-go meals are all cotton candy and corn dogs and such. That was one thing that, that uh, I thought about was that would, uh, that would pair really well with this one, but it wasn't until- Corn dog, it's talking about corn dogs, yes, not sorry. cotton candy. Sorry. Do not <laughs> pair cotton candy with this wine. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I think it would taste yucky, as Evan would say. <laughs> so I have a friend who makes Semion, an acquaintance of mine um, who is in the wine business and makes Semion, um, part of which one of he makes his skin fermented partially and then another one he makes is not and he's using concrete eggs and all kinds of different things. And um, I mentioned to him that one of my big hurdles to going commercial with one was, you know, the food pairing component. And he's from the South. Um, his name's Hardy Wallace. He has a dirty and rowdy winery. And um, he said fried chicken. And so sure enough, within the next couple of nights after sharing some wine with him, I went home and we attempted that recipe. And that's where we got the idea to get uh, Chef Christina's um, recipe which all, all the club members are getting in their club boxes all boxes you get the recipe i think i sent the link as well so you can go online and get christina's buttermilk fried chicken and you can do it with cauliflower too um you miss a little bit of the fat but um but fried cauliflower in the same way is pretty good so but yeah i know you think we learned sorry if you see beams going across our faces um those of you who were with us for the wine club party in june we have this tasting room right with the big windows and it just, we're constantly, we got sun. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with us. It's just the sunshine, which we're actually very happy to see, right? Mm -hmm. So um, let me click here. Color difference. Oh. Oh, yeah. Click again. Orange wine. Um, we do have a few questions, but we're going to cover the basics first, then I'll get to your questions about the orange wine. Um, orange wine originated, I don't know, they say five-ish thousand years ago, most likely in Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains. Um, so if you look down to the bottom, you see the mountains here between Russia and Armenia, Turkey, etc. And this is kind of one of the birthplaces of wine in general. Um, but it, this style of orange wine, um, they call it amber wine most often in Georgia and um, Romato in Italy. And for Italy, they make um, this kind of amber orange um, style of wine out of Pinot Grigio. That's their kind of their claim to fame there when it comes to this orange mm -hmm. category. Um, the top photo 
is the traditional Quevri, as best as I can tell it's pronounced. <laughs> Um, it is the kind of the, you know, amphora, the clay pots they bury in the ground. And so that's how they started. You know, they would just um, bury these grapes, right? And leave them alone. Is that correct, basically? Yeah, they would dump all the grapes and everything, you know, 100% stem inclusion, all the whole clusters and just seal it up with beeswax or some other type of, you know, clay or whatnot. And basically wait uh, nine moon cycles and come back and relieve it out of the container at that point and squeeze it off, you know, for the, for the juice that it had, then they would clean it. And um, there was all kinds of different medic uh, medicinal herbs and things and olive oil that was rubbed and scrubbed salt, all kinds of things on the inside where they would try and clean it, let it aerate for a month or two or three. And then the next vintage would go back inside the vessels. So the name obviously refers to the color. Um, <laughs> Uh, Kevin wrote, we are very happy to read it was made from oranges, or was not made from oranges. Um, yes, uh, if you see us making fruit wine, we have been body snatched. Um, <laughs> so call help, an exorcist, whatever it is. Um, we will not probably ever make uh, fruit wine. I only say probably because we have a quince tree and they make this beautiful booze out of quinces in France that I would love to make someday, but I'm not sure we have quite enough. So um, we'll see about that. But that's like distilled. That's, you know, the hard stuff, not fruit wine. Yeah. Eau de vie. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so what was the ration rationale in branding as orange wine versus skin contact Sauvignon Blanc? Oh, man. Yeah, that rolls <laughs> off the tongue. Like, you know, the, the official way to pronounce port is, you know, slightly sweet, partially fermented red table wine grapes. Um, orange wine is, is a category. I mean, it, you know, you have white, you have pink, you have green. I don't know how many are familiar with that. You have carbonated being the bubbles. Orange is a, is a whole, you know, kind of official category of family of wines. Um, the, the few other styles of wines that go into this that would have more orange color would be the ones, the white grapes with one pigment in the skin. So that would be Sauvignon Gris, Pinot Gris, um, any of those white grapes that end in Gris essentially have one pigment. So Pinot Noir has three pigments in the skin, Pinot Gris has one pigment, Pinot Blanc has no pigments. And so there's also a, a sub, we, we grow Sauvignon Blanc, there's also a gray ish version with one pigment called Sauvignon Gris, um, which is about half of the Sauvignon Blanc plant planting that's just in between Burgundy and Chablis. Um, there's a little appellation there that grows Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Gris. I don't know of any of them. Sambri? Is it called Sambri? Saint Brie or Saint, yeah. Sambri, yeah, anyway. In between Chablis <laughs> and Burgundy. Um, so this orange wine, I believe actually the term orange wine was invented by a British writer. Um, so that's why they call it amber wine, where it originates, um, or Romato or something else. Um, but it is kind of the darling of the natural wine world. And um, she started you know, feeling bad that we put a dog or our doggy on the label before our son. So uh, that's so true. She's such a helper with the orange <laughs> wine. We they had to had to put his name on the on the label to something. Yes, we felt like Evan deserved a wine after our dog, um, at the very least. So, um, but yes, he does always help with the orange wine. It's like because he made it. That's his like you know when we make it, he's he's here, he's involved. So um, we gave Evan a wine. Um, but you want to talk a little bit about why uh, kind of the natural wine movement in orange wine? Because it's kind of interesting. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure other than the fact that like the regions where it's made are just home, you know, also places where wine's been made forever. I'm mostly familiar with orange wines from the Alto Adige region, the northern part of the Italian Alps, where it's so cold that they can't grow red grapes. Other than that, I've only had experience with, I mean, two three other orange wines from California, one from Oregon, one from Washington. So um, it's, a, it's a very, very small, super, super niche market of wine. Um, and that's part of why it took us so long to, to go ahead and produce one. And we have, you know, one barrel's worth. So we're dipping our toe uh, in the shallow end very cautiously. Um, into the future, it may be potential we could make more because we have more Sauvignon Blanc to, to do that with. But um, you notice I put tasting notes like interesting and intriguing. 
Um, I find that this orange amber wine category, um, it generally tends to be a love it or hate it. It, you know, some people really like it. I love it. I think that um, just the, the aromas and the flavors and the, the tannin, that grippiness, you get the structure basically um, in this wine is really interesting for white wines. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting, the reason why we were excited to kind of have these two wines back to back is such a difference. So we've got the, the Van Gris, which is red grapes made like a white wine. Well, we've got the orange wine, which is white grapes made like a red wine. So it's kind of an interesting tasting to do together. But... What she said, I can't answer those questions <laughs> that quickly. Um, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's fun, the orange wine. It's just, we love just popping a bottle and trying food and being like, what does this go with? Let's try this, let's try that. Um, squash casserole. You guys got squashes if you have gardens right now, like out the yin yang um, so you know that squash traditional squash casserole old school um recipe where you just you know slice it up cheese people even put you know cracker crumbs on the top it's actually really good with the orange wine um, wide range of serving temperatures wide range of serving vessels some people even decant it like a young red wine um you don't have to chill it. I had that question uh, earlier, um, you know, yeah. And the colder <laughs> Maybe just it is, a little, little bit. the more you're gonna pick up on that tannin. Uh, that's what kind of happens when red wine gets cold, the perception of tannin increases. So with a white wine that has tannin, you'll have some of that effect as well. So regular, normal cellar temperature is fine. Um, just is more personal preference than anything um, because it's so out of the box. I, I don't know. Our, it's not like we're able to pour it and have a bunch of feedback in the tasting room right now. So you guys are the feedback at the moment. <laughs> You're our test market. <laughs> you have to give us feedback. Um, yeah, so food. Uh, it actually, you know, because it is kind of bold itself, um, you can do bolder foods. You could probably do a curry, you know, as long as it's not like, you know, makes you crazy cry spicy. <laughs> Um, you could even do some Korean barbecue. Uh, like we said, we like it with fried chicken. Um, the fried chicken enhances the tannin a little bit, but that's kind of why it's, I think it's a fun pairing. That's why this wine is different because it's a white with tannin. Um, charcuterie, just like a huge, you know, cheese and sliced salumi, et cetera. Um, because it has that tannin, you can treat it almost more like a red wine than, you know, than a white wine in a lot of circumstances, especially if you don't, you know, chill it a lot. And it's just, it's different. I mean, if you look up orange wine, the, the flavors and the aromas that you're going to see listed, um, because it is such a darling of the natural wine world, I mean, there's things like <laughs> mousiness and linseed oil and, and um, Gosh, what else? Our wines know. still it's... have to be clean. <laughs> we are not trying to make old world hands off wine and then pass it off as something overly funky. Um, yeah, this is not funky. It's not, you know, orange wine, amber wine can get into the very funky category. And this is not funky. At the far end of the spectrum, um, you get some, you know, you can, the really weird end of the spectrum, you can get some almost notes from different sour beers that you may try or different versions of hard apple ciders. Um, orange wine is it's trying to cross into some other mixed categories with all kinds of different beverages that are, they're trying to blend, you know, blur the lines to what's wine, what's beer, and that kind of stuff. Um, where we just stick with wine as wine, and other than the soda stream, don't mess with it. Oh, blueberries and plums, nice, darling. Why, yeah, why not? But we try it with everything <laughs> um, turkey and sweet potato gnocchi, absolutely. I think that would be great. I think this would be a great Thanksgiving wine, right? To bridge all those kind of different flavors. Um, desserts, yes. Pineapple, tropical fruit. Oh, pineapple. Oh, maybe like a little salt, you know, like if you can incorporate like a salted element. Oh, yeah. Um, I love that, Lori. You're making me hungry. <laughs> I know. It's almost, almost dinner time. Well, uh, well, not quite, but we can pretend, right? COVID, who knows? It's dinner time. It's happy hour. <laughs> It is what it is. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, we've, we've paired it with a number of things. Um, it's, that's kind of half the fun of this wine. And we, you know, we made a very small amount. So, um, you know, going back to the question of branding, um, we weren't really worried about the branding. We figured that, you know, 
you guys would want to try something different and weird and interesting and, you know, see what you liked it with. So, um, and if we put some of this in the library, which I hope um, we're able to, I think it's actually going to be really fun. Um, I think it's going to be one of those white wines we could pour at a library or wine event when we can all get together again, you know, some rainy or not March here um, a few years from now, maybe next year. Um, I think it'll be fun, you know, to, to taste this. So maybe we'll even have Evan when he's a little older, bring in a bottle of his own. We can compare Evan's orange wine with the commercially uh, released Evan's orange wine. Which we did uh, a few nights ago when, in preparing for this, you know, we had to practice. So we did the fried chicken recipe with um, each of my home versions, this commercial version, and then also the Evan's um, home version of orange wine as well. You guys ever smelled a bruised apple? Not like a rotten apple. Um, like the one that sits in the bottom of the fruit bowl and it just gets kind of like squished a little. Um, I get that sometimes from this wine. Like apple, but slightly bruised. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting, you know, that's being in the world of wine, we're always like smelling things. We're like, this goes to the compost. <laughs> and then it goes to the compost. Just, you know, see what it smells like. So, um, all right, barbecue fruit is another suggestion. Yes, barbecue fruit. That smoky, sweet yeah, combination. Never had growth. Um, that would be awesome with this wine. Which is really great. So, I look forward to hearing. You guys don't have to like, you know, email us and let us know what you've tried with this wine and what you like. Um, because as I said, it's you know we're constantly exploring um, and seeing what goes with it. Yes, grilled peaches, apple pie aromas. Yeah, like that baked apple. Like it's not that fresh, you know, super fresh, bright Granny Smith. It's definitely, you know, been baked, it's been bruised, it's been beaten up a little bit, for better or worse. All right. Ooh, stuffed acorn squash. Yeah, that would be amazing. Okay. Yes. Um, gosh, you guys have a lot of, you have a lot of input. It would just that like we've had a few glasses of wine or like you're just really into this wine. I don't know, but I love it. Concentrated caramelized apple. Um, oh yeah, and the, the Vengri and the sushi. I bet, yeah, it's got good acidity. So um, I, I do want to roll back to, I know Melissa, you had a question about ageability of uh, rosé, but I want to um, stay on topic with the orange wine. Do you guys have any, any other comments or questions um, you want to say out loud about the orange wine or we're all, we got, got our chat on now, so we're good. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was something different. It wasn't what I didn't have any expectations, so I couldn't say it wasn't what I expected, but it's really nice. It has great flavor. It's, it's complex. It's not, you know, simple. And I, I thought it was wonderful. Oh, thank you, Paula. Yeah, there's not many people here in the U.S. that do orange wine styles. There's a few, a few in California, a couple. Um, I think in New York State, right, there's a little bit of orange wine being made, but it's, it's not... Um, or they some some call it Armado, some call it amber wine. So it's also hard as a consumer to know if you're not an orange wine geek um, what exactly it is. But you know, there's maybe a handful of us, I think. Um, so it's not terribly common. All right. So there was a question we missed, kind of. We, we didn't really miss it, but um, we didn't get to it. We were talking about the Van Gogh. Um, let's see. So it was why do more traditional rosés not age? or drink better young versus this Van So I would say the traditional rosés do actually age well. There's just very little traditional rosé made domestically or imported. All the greatest things of any country stay in that country and the laws in Europe are so heavily regulated, you're not even allowed to make as bad of wine as sort of our Central Valley um, uh, is able to produce sort of year in and year out. My issue with unageable white just to clarify, is what I call the fast white. And that, again, is bottled, you know, harvested in September, bottled in January, released by April 1, otherwise known as day one of Q2 post-vintage. 
So if you're working with any lending institution or any banker, you have to have your white SKUs in the market by April 1st. And so what you have to do to rush that wine through the process strips ageability. Also, when you're rushing wine out, that also the quality is not going to be as good. So the price is lower. And so where you're getting the grapes from is very different as well. One of the reasons that this that ours will be exceptionally ageable is that it still is, you know, Charles Vineyard Pinot Noir fruit. Now I'm super picky. I won't use it for the premium red, but if any of you are willing to pay $60 a bottle for pink wine, sign up and I'll make as much pink as you want from that other block. <laughs> it's just, we need that other trellising. Um, white wine has this problem as well. I mean, white grapes have to produce twice as much grapes per acre because wineries pay half as much. Consumers pay, um, pardon me, pay about half as much as well. And so uh, until like in Burgundy, you're willing to pay the same amount of money for a Grand Cru Chardonnay as you are a Grand Cru Pinot Noir um, or Grand Cru White or Grand Cru Red, um, then, then we could change some of that balance. And so white grapes are becoming more scarce in Anderson Valley and that's gonna become even more dramatic now than it's been in the last handful of years. It's very difficult to produce inexpensive white wine that's of quality. Um, I hope that answered your question, Melissa. Just know your producer. If it's proper rosé, whole cluster pressed grapes, most likely you're going to have something that can easily go three to five years. And those producers are probably not putting that in the market that April 1st date um, because that, that style isn't even financeable. Um, I could not, I'm not uh, able to, to use lenders. We eliminated that from the whole scenario because of the way that we produce wine. It just literally does not fit the widget. There are no comps near me making wine like we do, therefore we're not bankable. And um, that's, that's a huge problem. Most white wine in this country is made by CFOs, CPAs with caveats put on by your lending institution. And so you're just not given the freedom. Now in Europe, if we were in Burgundy, I couldn't even grow Sauvignon Blanc. So that wouldn't be any fun either. They'd force me to grow Chardonnay or Aligote. Um, but uh, I don't know. Type a follow up if you have one. I have a question. You guys know Joe. He's nothing if not a purist. Um, it's all black and white when it comes to winemaking. So <laughs> we do what we do. We try and do it well. Um, ah, thank you, Ginny. Can't keep it more than a month. It's too good. I know. I love it too. Um, Chardonnay's highest calling is sparkling wine. <laughs> If you want to get Joe riled up, ask him if he's going to make a Chardonnay. No, I've made a lot of Chardonnay for Launder, and still to this day, the highest scoring wine in the history of Wine Spectator for Mendocino County is the 2010 Corby Chardonnay uh, that came from there. Um, Chardonnay, I think it's highest calling is sparkling wine, so that's, that's where we would head. Um, I, I would maybe say Chablis, but Chablis is not typically goes through Mallow, and I'm not really a big fan of sterile filtration, so... That's a, that's a tough style for me to think about. We have some vintages in our Sauvignon Blanc that we call more oystery or more acidic, which lend, you know, which are just more of that. And then some that are a little bit richer and fatter, but again, that's not anything we're manipulating behind the scenes with additives. It's just trying to nail the pick date for best grapes of the vintage. White burgundy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no interest. It's, it costs the same as red burgundy. I'm just going to buy red burgundy. I mean, I wish I had more zeros in my bank account. To, uh, I'll just go north and buy this Chardonnay that has bubbles. In it. <laughs> so for once, we don't have Nancy and Ken on today, but um, she knows my secret. When Joe goes on a ski trip, what I do is I open a Chardonnay and I paint my toenails and I eat peanut noodles because he hates all three of those items. <laughs> like a good oaky Chardonnay, right? Um, you know, but I used to work in Napa. So, you know, we, we don't all drink the same things. We don't, you know, that's I the like, beauty of it. I do like Richard Chardonnay when it's old because the, the oakiness um, drops out and becomes more of like a creme brulee or kind of twisted yeah. almond. We do have some things. lovely old launder Chardonnays. We've been really surprised um, getting back to the early really aughts, we call them, um, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that have been really, really lovely, actually, laid down for a while that we didn't accept. You know, the whole little secret, the whole white portion of this vineyard was originally planted to Chardonnay, and at year two, it was all sawed off and butted over to Pinot and Sauvignon Blanc at that time. So that was the originally original thing that was planted here in 01, and then they, they had the great Chardonnay crash of 02. So it didn't take long to uh, give, give it the uh, 
the SNP. Um, and same thing that we've done. So in that Pinot that we're talking about for the Vin Gris, that actually is rootstock under the ground and then up to about four inches above the ground. Then there's like four inches of Chardonnay and then there's four inches of Sauvignon Blanc and now there's Pinot that grows out of the top. So it's, it's unduplicatable in that regard. And part of the reason the flavors in our Sauvignon Blanc is so different than even our neighbors that have the same clone is that we're actually growing so our unique clone of Sauvignon Blanc through Chardonnay. And so it's, uh, it's, it's unduplicatable. When you bud over like that, you don't have to have the whole vine replace its whole root system. It's the same as you would do with grafting in fruit trees or um, anything like that. So we're actually able to just give it a snip and they do a grafting of a new bud. And in two to three years, you know, you're back to full production instead of waiting five or six or seven. Um, much dramatic less cost too. I mean, you don't have to redo the, the whole root system and, you know, let the field go fallow and all those things. So I want to I want to um, have a little vote here uh, just to see what everybody preferred just for fun or no right answer on this. Um, so you can just like, you know, put your hand up. Um, so who preferred the, the Van Gria Pinot Noir? Okay. And who we didn't preferred taste the it. Wine? We didn't taste it. Oh, we tasted, uh, we tasted the orange. All right, so I think uh, we probably have a few more fans for the Van Gris, but, but you guys are pretty split. Huh? That's, that's awesome. 